Hi, everybody. My name is Lori Flynn, and I'm the president of Link to Libraries. And I am so excited today um, to be kicking off our new Book Light series with someone who is really near and dear to my heart, and not only to my heart, but to our organization. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Stratton has been a part of Link to Libraries since it was founded almost 13 and a half years ago. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> and I have had the honor of knowing her almost as long um, and actually starting this journey with her. Um, and now we are here today to talk about the book that is the end result of that journey, though we hope that there's much more work to come. So thank you very much, Jen. This is the book that we are here to talk about today, Nick Springer on the Move, written by Jennifer Stratton and illustrated by Christopher Custer. Before we dive into the book, because there's so much to talk about here, you know, um, I just want to give everybody just a brief few words about who you are and what you do, okay, to kind of put it into context. So Jen has nearly two decades in the field of education. She's currently a professor at Bay Path University in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. She's committed to sharing her expertise in multicultural education and literacy and creating change in children's literature by shining a light on underrepresented groups. She hosts a blog dedicated to raising awareness about athletes with exceptionalities who play adaptive sports. And that's kind of a great leeway into what you've written about here. Um, so welcome, Jen. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lori. I was so excited to get this invitation to talk books Absolutely. With you. And like Especially I said, I was book. so thrilled. This is a, now a book that we can hold in our hands and talk about. So it's great, great yeah. work. Why don't you, if you don't mind, just take a few minutes. Um, this story is a very personal story for you. Um, and if you could talk to us a little bit about that and about where you got the idea that this story needed to be told as a picture book. Sure. That's a good question. It is. This is... Um... This story is so important and I hold very close to my heart. Um, so Nick Springer is actually a family member. So he is my um, husband's cousin and he has been an incredible role model to my children and myself. And um, so we have shared Nick's story, which is he was born fully able-bodied and contracted meningococcal meningitis at the age of 14. And to save his life, the doctors had to amputate, partially amputate all four limbs below the elbows and above the knees. And um, he then had to learn how to live a new way, a new life. And part of that was adaptive sports. So he actually became, um, started with sled hockey and then it led into wheelchair rugby and he became a world-class athlete. And so when my children were born, um, Caitlin was, it was 2008 when she was born, Nick was in the Paralympic games. She was in my arms. We were watching on the computer as he was in Beijing and leading Team USA to a gold medal. So it was just an incredible, He's just an incredible individual. He also, on top of that, was an advocate for the meningitis um, vaccine that we now currently have. You know, um, they had the vaccine, but it wasn't as much awareness about it. And it wasn't instituted, um, like required for uh, camps or colleges to have it. So hence, he didn't have access to it. Um, but uh, so he was a national spokesperson on that and even um, international. So he's just been an incredible role model for our family. And with that, my um, my children grew up telling his story and knowing his story. And um, what happened was my daughter was in kindergarten and she'd actually come to work with me. And I had a poster of Nick on my office door when I was teaching at a, a local college. And she asked she it was going to be her um, opportunity to do show and tell in kindergarten and she asked to share the poster and I said of course you can and I was so proudly taking it off the door and rolled it up for her and then I thought about it and I thought oh I should probably email the teacher so she knows what wheelchair rugby is she I have so many videos so I sent I emailed the teacher ahead of time the night before and I sent her links to Nick playing articles about Nick just there's a lot of information um, that I thought she would want to share with the students I was surprised by her response. She actually emailed me um, and she said that she wasn't going to let Caitlin share the poster. She said, quote unquote, it would scare the children. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm a professor of education. I've taught kindergarten <laughs> and um, I knew wow. that she was absolutely incorrect. She couldn't have been more incorrect. And I knew not only was she incorrect, 
but this was this was the type of conversation we're supposed to have in kindergarten. Right, we should be um, talking about these exactly, things. Exactly, right. So when um, I thought about that, I, I'll admit, I readily admit I was angry. So I stepped away from the computer. I didn't email her back, um, but I knew <laughs> I would share it. And she did. And Caitlin did end up sharing it. And of course, the kids thought he was totally awesome. But it made me think about things. You know, I thought, well, what tools does this teacher have? Like, why is she not wanting to share this? Why does she not want to have these conversations in her classroom? So I started doing the research and I started looking at children's literature. And I started taking out in particular biographies, um, picture book biographies. And I read over like a hundred of them and just kept taking them out, looking at it. And then what I realized was the people with disabilities were not, it was like non-existent. They were not represented in these picture book biographies. There were one or two, I could find Wilma Rudolph, um, which is called Wilma Unlimited. And she had some braces at the beginning, but at the end overcomes her disability and becomes one of the fastest women in the world. Um, the book behind me actually, Emilio's Dream had just been published when I was doing all the research. And That's one of our Link to Libraries favorites. <laughs> it's a great book. And he was born with a limb difference. Right. Um, but there certainly weren't. So the, I couldn't believe they were like, she didn't have the tools. I don't agree with what she did. Um, but I started realizing that there was this void in children's literature around people with disabilities. You could find a few books on, you can find books on disabilities. Like you could find a book about autism or maybe a book about cerebral palsy, but you couldn't find books about athletes who play adaptive sports or who play a sport in a, a traditional sport in an adaptive manner. And so when I started realizing that that wasn't available, I thought, well, I'm gonna make it available. And so I just, I literally was like, oh, I'm just gonna start a blog. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of, I had never done a blog, never planned to do a blog, but started one. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna start a blog and I'm gonna interview athletes. And I'm gonna start with Nick because that's the story that should go up first. So I started, I told Nick what I was doing. I told him about the incident. And he, he was, he handled it better than I did. Um, I was really upset. Um, he was like, Jen, it happens, you know? And so he was excited that I was taking action. I was going to start this blog. And so I interviewed him a few times. He then led me to other athletes and I just kept asking athletes, who do you want to see on this blog? And then, um, and then there was an athlete, like I always wanted to interview Jim Abbott. I was big, fan of him growing up. Um, he's a one-handed pitcher who had played for the Yankees. And I had seen him pitch at Fenway when he played for the Angels. And wow. I thought, oh, that'd be cool. Like, how cool to interview him. And so I just started asking and he agreed. And he was incredibly intelligent and humble man. Um, but I just started. And as I kept interviewing these athletes, I would ask, so did you have any books to read when you were growing up that where you felt represented? And they were like, no, I wish I had. Oh no, there were no books. And a lot of them, not only did I, I found out two things. One, there weren't books for them to feel represented. And then they, a lot of them had really difficult time accessing youth sports, which is a whole nother issue. Right. Um, you know, really finding a place for them to be active. So, um, so that just led me on to this research. And then I started writing Nick's book. So I had the blog and I was interviewing athletes. And then I started writing Nick's book, as you know, and I just kept working on it and tweaking it. Um, and that was such a labor of love. And I just kept getting interview Nick over and over again and um, knowing him in such an intimate way to get to tell his story accurately. And in, in a way that's appropriate, because I should mention, um, he plays right. wheelchair rugby. Wheelchair rugby is known as murder ball. <laughs> um, yeah, murder ball. It so is a tough sport, sport. yes. yes. <laughs> and, and rightfully so. The reason is they smash. They smash hard with their wheelchairs. And, Just like uh, we do with bodies right. in a non-adaptive way, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. And so it's a really, really tough sport where they're you know crashing into each other. It's part of why, why Nick loved it. Um, it's a fast sport. It's a hard sport. But when you find athletes as tough as Nick, um, the language they use is really colorful <laughs> and not necessarily appropriate for a children's book. So um, uh, in the interviews, I would often have to say, well, Nick, I'm going to have to change the language a little bit on this. So, uh, um, but it was great, great fun to uh, be able to represent wheelchair rugby in a children's book to let people know about these incredible athletes. 
Absolutely. One of the things I commend you on, and I wanted to tell you up front too, is to correct me if I say anything incorrectly, because you have a whole language built around how to talk to people, how to talk about people or characters in a book with exceptionalities. Um, can you help just for a moment? I know that there are teachers and librarians out there, some of our volunteer readers, around uh, the appropriate language or things to think about when we're talking to young children about characters or people with these sorts of issues. Great. That's a super question. I think why people get nervous talking about it. Great. Um, so what's the language? First of all, um, ask the individual with the disability what language they like to use. That's my the best go to for it. And so, for example, um, so Nick liked to be called a quad amputee because all four limbs were amputated. Uh, my youngest son is born with a limb difference like Emmanuel was. So that means he had a, uh, my youngest son has an upper limb difference. So he does not have a left hand, although we call it his little hand. And um, he does consider himself, he is a, what's called a congenital amputee. So he will call himself an amputee or you'll hear him talk about his little hand. So I just give that as a reference that you need to talk to the individual. Some people will say they're amputees. Some people will have the limb difference. Um, you know, I the most important part is to talk and then ask, right. right? So like, I like using the term, it's people with disabilities. We use the people, the individual first, the person first. So we use person first language um, and we can talk about exceptionalities. I, we use that term a lot on my blog and as individuals in our family, we talk about having exceptionalities because the disability is actually within the society. So it's the society that has something within their system that may be disabling, but the right. individual does not, right? Um, but then you will hear my youngest son, he, he knows he is, he'll say like, well, he's a disabled individual, but he doesn't like it when people see him as disabled, right? There's two different right. things. He can, so he can use it to advocate for himself and that's important. So people with disabilities will want to claim, like they may say, well, I'm a disabled individual and there's real empowerment in that. But then to view them as disabled, unable to do things is very inaccurate. So see how the language, I guess what we need to realize is language isn't just set in stone. It's evolving just like we live, right? So it's constantly right. changing. So some of the terms I can tell you today could be wrong tomorrow. So thank you so much for giving us some language around this topic and how to talk with kids and even adults about these sorts of things, because I think it's really helpful. I think you're right. I think sometimes people are let themselves be scared away from something because they don't fully understand it. And they a lot of people don't want to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So they shy away from it then, too. So thank you for helping literally give us some words when we're talking about things like this. Um, one other thing I wanted to be sure we covered is that one of the other great things about this book is about is the illustrations and the illustrator himself. So it's not it's Nick's story, but there's another story here, too. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I was very purposeful on the publishing company that I used, um, which then connected me with this illustrator. So I actually went and reached out to Mouth and Foot Painting Artists, which is a a nonprofit organization that publishes books. Um, they also do artwork, Christmas or holiday cards. Um, and so I actually reached out to them. They actually do not use outside writers. Um, they don't usually typically work with people who are fully able-bodied. They employ artists who either paint with their mouths or their feet due to amputation or paralysis. And okay. yeah, and I thought, okay, I need to reach out to this organization. They need to publish this book because then I can work with an illustrator who would understand Nick's story at a level that I can't, right? And they can bring something that I never could to the story because I am fully able-bodied. I should have said that at the beginning. I have children with invisible, invisible disabilities, but me, myself, I am fully able-bodied. So there's a limitation that comes with that. 
especially when you're trying to represent a story accurately. So I reached out to them and said, here's my story. Here's what I'm thinking. And they were like, yes, this story absolutely belongs on the shelves. And we actually think we have an artist for you. And so they connected me with Christopher Custer. He's an artist down in Florida. Um, He, like Nick, was born fully able-bodied. And he was in Florida and in his teens and dove into some shallower water. And it was a beach he had always gone to and suffered a spinal cord injury, which were resulted in paralysis. Um, So he actually um, has limited mobility of his hands. So he paints with his mouth. And he actually is known for um, doing sports cars and sports boats. And so he has these really awesome action kind of illustrations. Um, He can also do landscapes, right? But well, that was it, right? Because one of the things we talked about Um, when I was speaking with mouth and foot painting artists was that it had to be someone who could do bold. This is a bold story. Nick is a bold guy. So it had to be really bold. Um, The person had to be willing to break rules, not think, oh, this is a book for children. Like, no. I so, and Nick was, um, Chris was willing to dive into all that and challenge himself in new ways. And he had never done a children's book. He doesn't typically do people. And he, but Nick's story spoke to him. It inspired him, he said, and uh, it motivated him. And so he really challenged himself and he did such an incredible job. And it is amazing when you take time to look at every illustration. Um, First of all, he brought movement to every picture, even the pictures when Nick is not moving, there's movement in it. I'm just going to hold up while you're talking a little bit. So people who haven't seen the book yet, yeah, and then he did what I I didn't find this out till later, but he actually loves cartoons. So I love the way he did the crash, right? Oh and yeah. So it kind of makes you feel like the old Batman, you know? Um, <laughs> Wham! Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and I love that about it. Um, and here's so, a picture of him at work, just so yeah. people can see. I mean, how incredible! It is incredible. Was he an artist prior to his accident, or is it something he discovered after? It, it was like a new a new ability that he had discovered, right? Yeah. So when he has actually, I've seen some video he just recently over the summer did some video of himself painting. And it's just an incredible process, right? Which would be such a nice thing for an educator or librarian to use if they're reading this book to show them, you know, how the, I agree. How the artist approaches the artwork. Yeah. So um, on the blog, I have pictures of him. I hope to add some video of him actually doing it because it's really incredible you know he's just inches away and he's using the markers and he has and what's so neat is he's adapted the style to work for him right that's what we mean by finding the ability within the disability he's able to create art he just does it in a different modality Um, so tell us before you go any further please tell us how to find your blog ah thank you okay so my blog's easy it's jenstratton.com that's it j-e-n and there's my name (laughs) jenstratton.com and there you'll find it says Jen Stratton and Team Possible because there's a whole group of athletes and parents and um, and others who have been supporting this work for a very long time. And on that website, you will find all sorts of re- first you'll find a link to purchase the book. It'll take you right to Mouth and Foot Painting Artists. It is not sold on Amazon. It goes right through Mouth and Foot Painting Artists. And the reason for that is all the proceeds go to either Mouth and Foot Painting Artists or they go to Wheelchair Sports Federation. So all the proceeds Wonderful. are, yes, exactly. They're either supporting artists who, um, like I said, illustrate with their mouths or feet, or it's going to Wheelchair Sports Federation, which is in New York, and that started Nick on this incredible um, sports journey. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And do you have any other resources on that website for people who might want to share Nick Springer with the classroom? Oh, um, yes. There's a ton. So um, first there's also, so I had to do a lot of research. So I made sure that was included in a very kid friendly way. So there's on Padlet, a timeline of Nick's life. So the students can actually see pictures of Nick um, and the news articles that went along with it and have a timeline. So, um, so they'll have those resources available, right? So if you were doing research with children, Um, there's a lot on wheelchair rugby and wheelchair sports. There's actually a video. I've been working with a doctoral student, Sam Brady from the UK, and he just created a brief video. It's about four minutes on the evolution of the sports wheelchair. It's incredible. 
what I what he did was he showed that so when wheelchairs were first invented, they were literally chairs with wheels because it was to move them around the hospital out of the way. That was where it kind of started. They never thought that these patients would want to be doing work or playing sports. So the patients themselves started adapting the chairs. And so it's such a social justice issue in that the wheelchairs we see today were not engineered by people who didn't have disabilities who were thinking, and they help, but really the athletes themselves were like, no, 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 we need smaller wheels here, or we need a larger wheel here, or the wheel needs to be tilted in. And so Sam's video shows you the evolution of wheelchairs. How fascinating. Um, it is. And if you actually look carefully at the illustrations in Nick's book, you'll see like Nick, when he first uses a wheelchair, uses one of those really clunky hospital ones. And then he moves to a sports chair. And yeah, not people, what he won his medal in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. It looks like it's, right? So um, it's, it's really exciting for people, I think, especially for children, to realize, wait, there's lots of different wheelchairs. And there's sports-specific wheelchairs. And, um, you know, people can – it just shows also the ingenuity and innovation of these athletes. Absolutely. I mean, there's it's such an inspiring story. I mean, they're, they're heroes of their own stories, mm -hmm. um, which are great no matter all kids. They're good for all kids and all adults to hear these types of things, which is great. And for kids who do have difficulties or exceptionalities who are in school classrooms, mm -hmm. who may be in a classroom where a book like this is being read, you know, I can only imagine how inspiring that would be too. And just to see you know, we talk a lot in the children's book world about own voices right now where, um, and it's gotten a lot better. We have a lot more multi multicultural books. We have a lot more books about social justice. We have a lot more choices of books being written by authors who've actually experienced the things that they're writing about. Um, and I hope and I suspect that this book would perhaps give someone being read the story, the inspiration and the confidence to go out and share their story too. I which hope- is such a gift. And that's the next part that actually will be coming up on the blog is about how to help children tell their own stories. Um, really? And so for children to write their own story and because of different um, abilities, you can do that in a lot of different ways. So it's going to the website's going to be talking about how to help children like you know plot that out. But more importantly, using multiple modalities to tell your story. Um, and I do just want to mention that before this became a hard book that we could actually hold, I actually did share parts of the story in my son's classroom with him. And um, and here he was speaking about Nick, who was a family member and amputee. And my son, like I said, is a congenital amputee. It empowered him in a way to speak to his peers that was truly remarkable. And what was neat was the way his peers opened up. One girl saying, you know... I, I, when I first met you, I was nervous about your little hand. I wasn't sure what you could do, but then I saw you could do this in art and this. And so it allowed them to have this very honest, open conversation. Um, and I hope Nick's book does that in lots of classrooms, allows for critical conversations. Um, so kids can honestly ask questions and share their thoughts. Absolutely. I encourage any teachers or educators out there to think about going to that website and looking to find this book because it's, first of all, super timely right now. The Paralympics are happening, you know, as we are we are talking, yeah. right? Um, and so that will be fresh in everybody's minds, the Olympics and the Paralympics as kids are coming back to school this fall. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention, and you and I had spoken about this, about the representation of people with disabilities in children's literature and how often when you see people, um, it was a pirate, right? Yeah. It was a gratuitous child in a wheelchair yeah. in, a, in a group shot. Um, so thank you for working yeah. and trying to change that. Yeah, that's been my biggest challenge. And actually that was kind of what really pushed me to do it was, um, was reading a book actually. It was a, I'd been writing the book, but to get really get it published, I, I really, there was a moment where I was actually reading to my youngest and we were reading a book about money. It's money. And then, a, and then I switched pages and there was a pirate and he had, he had a hook and, and he had a sword in the other hand. And I thought, this is the only spot my son is seeing himself and he's seeing himself with a weapon. Yeah. 
this isn't okay. And then so I actually started researching pirate books, to be very honest, because there was a vast overrepresentation of amputees and people with visual impairments in pirate books. Yep. And that's where we have amputees right now in children's literature. And that's not where they belong. Right. That's belong. not where they belong. No. <laughs> that's not what we need. <laughs> right. And so the sports section seems more appropriate to me. Absolutely. Especially with the next book. Um, but yeah, there there is... There's a lot of, and because of that, there's like a lot of misconceptions that go along with it, right? Absolutely. Well, that's, you know, another interesting thing that someone might talk about if they're reading a book with a pirate in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, take that as a moment to pause and talk about what's being represented there. Um, you know, and, make good of that book. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, one other piece I should mention, and this is actually something I learned from my college students, was um, we started investigating the representation of women with disabilities in children's literature, in particular mm. mothers. It is extremely difficult. I can name one book right now where you can see a mother who has a disability. It's Mama Zooms. And that was written in like 1990. It's really a much wow. older book. And so that's also it. So why are we, we don't have adults, we don't have caregivers with disabilities in these yeah. so children are not only seeing not seeing themselves but they're not also seeing who they can be right um that's a great point yeah, yeah. so i really hope yeah. we start seeing more representation of people with disabilities in books about families about yeah. love about friendship um, absolutely yeah. which am i allowed to ask now that this is published are you working <laughs> what's your next book what's you do you have another project in the works oh of course <laughs> Well, I've got a couple, to yeah. be really honest. Okay, so mm -hmm. the first one is um, on Dr. Ludwig Gutmann, who is actually um, a Jewish uh, Holocaust refugee. He's the founder and the visionary of the Paralympic Games. And his story is amazing. Um, I'm actually proud to say that there's a museum called the Paralympic Heritage Trust in um, Stoke Manville, um, England which is where he started the Paralympics and had the vision. And Nick's book is on the shelves there. It, um, oh, wow. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Wow, um, yes. But Gutman has been a true inspiration for me. So I've been doing the research on him. So that will be um, the next picture book. And I'm actually going to co-author that with a woman from Canada who is, um, who is an inclusive um, fitness trainer. Um, she has cerebral palsy and we've presented and she's at, we've, we're going to co-write that for a variety of reasons. Um, Fascinating. She, yeah. She also is truly inspired by it. So that will be interesting. I had um, a request from my youngest and then <laughs> my daughter got involved as well. Uh, kind of a, a middle grade chapter book where all the main characters have disabilities and there's kind of like a junior Paralympic Games, and they also had to be um, spies. So, right? Well, of course. <laughs> <Not enough>. uh, <laughs> so, of course, they're spies. So, oh, I'm that still working. Fun. Yeah, that's on a rewrite. So, um, that one is super fun. Um, Shriners Hospital was kind enough to let me visit and look at what they use and look at it through a spy lens, which was really quite fun. Um, so, so we have lots to look forward to. I'm yeah, so thrilled. I think I'll dive into the fiction world and keep writing in the nonfiction. Um, but what yes. I do know is I'm just gonna keep writing until all these shelves are filled, <laughs> right? Like they, they need to be, sh like we need to add, they need to be filled with greater representation. I think you are absolutely right. And I am so honored to talk to you about this book and so proud of you and just thrilled, thrilled that we are now able to hold this book in our hands and to share it with people. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is an incredibly busy life uh, to spend some time with us today and share a bit about the story and how it came to be. Um, and I would highly recommend that anybody out there check out Jen's blog if you would like to learn more. And you can always contact us through Link to Libraries through our contact form on our website if you have any questions for Jen or you'd like to follow up at all on the interview today. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you so much we'll for having me. We'll talk about the next book, okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Bye.